Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering VMworld 2017. Brought to you by VMware and its ecosystem partners. Hi, I'm Stu Miniman here with my co-host Keith Townsend. You're watching theCUBE's coverage of VMworld 2017 here in Las Vegas. Happy to welcome to the program two guests. We're going to dig into what's happening in the cloud space, big, big hot topic uh, of the show. Uh, Dave Shikosius, who is the Vice President of Product Management at CenturyLink. Ajay Patel, SUP and GM of now Cloud Provider Software nice. at VMware. Gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Stu. See you again, Stu. Yep. All right, so, uh, you know, Dave, here's a question we, we, we asked coming into this week. Okay. Uh, VMware was doing this vCloud Air for a bunch of years. Ah, oh, they're a competitor, no, they're a partner with the vCloud Air network. You know, vCloud Air, yeah. you know, now, now went over to, to OVH. And I think they waited 42, 48 hours before they made this big deal with AWS. So, uh, you know, to tell, tell us how the relationship's been as, you know, a, a, one of, you know, not just one of the 4,500 service providers, but, you know, you're sitting on panels with, with VMware, you're, you're, you're yeah. uh, you know, one of, one of the, the, the larger partners, so. Yeah, and we, yeah we, were, we were on a panel discussion and we were talking about this earlier today, right? And, you know, I think, you know, when vCloud Air launched, you know, we'd had some of these same conversations and there were probably CUBE discussions where uh, you know, the same, almost the same question was asked. And you know, what, what, we, what I said back then and what, what, what a lot of us in the service provider community said back then and we say it again now, is that, you know, and this is true not just of VMware, but this is true of any uh, enterprise architect, you're, you run a better system, you build better software when you're running it 24 seven as a live service. It's just better, right? You, the software is better, the user experience is better, you're thinking about integration angles and availability issues. Think the software gets better when you run it operationally. And VMware's technology got better when they launched vCloud Air and figured out that their virtualization technology, what they had been working with the service provider community around for years, you know, it, it, it improved when they went and launched it and, and lived the life of a service provider. So we're actually excited about that. We're aligning to the same architecture. What's nice is that what they're running in the cloud and around VMware Cloud Foundation exactly. is the same thing we're running uh, in our cloud neutral facilities um, inside of uh, the, the CenturyLink data center footprint. So it's very interoperable. All right, uh, Ajay, yeah, Ajay, please. Yeah, yeah, so bring so us my up response speed, would yeah. be, you know, a few things that have changed. One is, you know, there wasn't a cloud provider software business unit. I am dedicated to make likes of David successful, right? Taking that IP and commercializing that, that's fundamental to our, our strategy. Second one is, we rebranded this to VMware Cloud Providers. The idea is you can get VMware Cloud in one of three ways. You can build it yourself, get it on VMware Cloud on AWS, more importantly, but get it through our partners. Your choice based on the best cloud that fits your needs. So it's that level playing field both on go to market, in terms of Jeff Waters now as a cloud sales leader over all of the different programs, technology, IP being made available, compensation neutrality. These are all the things we're quote unquote learn from our VM VCA experience, if you will, to do this right, so that we continue to drive a multi-cloud strategy. And it's really about center on customer choice, right? Yep. So, yeah, go ahead. So, I'm sorry, can we talk about the basic difference between those three delivery methods? Absolutely. What from a customer perspective, what's the, what's the difference in the look and, and feel of those? So I think at the end of the day, it's about get, getting VMware value in an integrated fashion, but that's not just sufficient, right? So when you go to cloud, it's no longer just, hey, give me a virtualized environment. That's the, quote unquote, the hard bit of just packaging stuff infrastructure, but that's not enough value. On top of that is the application is really the value. Managing that application, the life cycle of the value. This is where the likes of CenturyLink really come into play. So we believe, you know, we're kind of you know, democratizing in terms of the consumption of a cloud stack in one of three ways. It's really customer preference and how much burden they want to take on. On the private cloud side, they're building it instead of buying it as a service. If they prefer to go on AWS for whatever reason for their cloud strategy, they now have a VMware choice or they can go to a partner like CenturyLink to help them manage the entire journey, including manage multiple clouds, right? So it's really about that customer choice, what's right for them, yep. which is putting them in a silo, right? What's really been good for us around, especially around the, the VMware Cloud Foundation reference architecture is that it starts to make the private clouds react predictably. Um, and our offer now that has now been architected and based around VMware Cloud Foundation, it stands up with the, the software-defined data center architecture at each of the layer of the stack. It's allowed us, we don't have to orchestrate nearly as many technology sets in order to make a private cloud happen. We've been running hosted private cloud for as long as there have been hosted private clouds. CenturyLink has been managing it as part of uh, you know, the, the, the cloud service provider program and all its earlier naming variants. <laughs> um, but we're, 
what this this latest architecture allows us to do is not only you know remove the number of things that we need to integrate against the, the integration code we need to write and all the different vendor technologies we need to orchestrate against it. It pulls it all into one scale out software, a divine stack, which makes our uh, our customer experience better. It drives better self service and more reliable self service into the hands of our customers so that they can move faster, and it allows our private cloud to become more predictable so that we can start managing it with our multi cloud cloud application manager product. So we launched that earlier this year. It's a, it was the combination of some of the, ma the managed hosting tools and capabilities that we've had back in the Savas days. It combines in uh, the abstraction software we got from a company called Elastic Box that we acquired last year. And we weave that together into one multi-cloud layer. So it now looks at private clouds and other public clouds as just another deployment destination uh, on that uh, multi-cloud management journey. Effectively competition moving above the SCDC layer. Yep. We're kind of making SCDC common. Let's compete on the value and the solutions that we right. have. Oh, ironically, this was the promise of open source pro projects to make this <laughs> common platform across yep. private, public, and multiple and multi clouds. Uh, exactly. So, from you use the term that not a lot of people may not be familiar with: cloud neutral facilities. What what is that term? So you know, a, a cloud neutral facility is one that can basically get you connected to a number of different cloud deployment form factors, right? Um, you know, it's not a one node show, you know, a, a one, uh, you know, one approach kind of model. Um, and so it's it, it's really about a service provider that, uh, from a, you know, when you said the term facility, I mean, that can really just be a service provider environment that basically gets the particular workload to the best execution venue for that individual uh, set of uh, you know runtime conditions. So you know. Uh, to us, you know, being in a more of a cloud neutral posture um, certainly means you know, we're bringing some parts of uh, our hosted environment, whether it's private or we have a multi-tenant environment that we can provision to as well. Um, we use that multi-tenant environment to actually speed up our own development of higher level services. Um, and then we partner uh, across uh, the different cloud portfolios, the, the different cloud service providers like AWS and Microsoft Azure. We tie into that. It's really about looking at the data center as an extension of all the potential runtime venues, both ones that you might build on your own and then ones that are available to you. Yeah, D Dave, I want you to expand on that some, because yeah. you know, one of the things I I've been getting out of this week is that maturation of how we've been talking about cloud. So, a couple of years ago, I was critical of yeah. VMware. It's like, you know, any device, any application, one cloud. I'm like, wrong, no. no. Mm. Amazon, you know, absolutely 100% public cloud. I, I think they understand it's not 100%. We'll, yeah. we'll see where you know uh, Amazon goes in the future. You said you're tying into the likes of, of Amazon and Azure. I'm assuming that's Direct Connect and, and those kind of services. Yeah. Where you know how do we think of CenturyLink? Where do you add value? How do you make money in these various pieces? I remember mm -hmm. you know Savas was one of the you know V Cloud Air data centers, and right. boy margins were going to be real tight on something like that. Sure. So. Yeah, I mean the. So the, our, our, our multi-cloud posture and, and, the, we're, and the direction we see things going um, is really one that it starts and it, and, and it the largest you know, sort of anchor point for CenturyLink strategy is the strength of our network. Right? It's all the places that that network can take us. And a lot of the investments that we've made in virtualization management, a lot of the investments we've made around managing workloads inside data centers we control has really been a precursor to how we need to evolve the core of our network and how our network is becoming more software defined. Um, you know, we built and we launched, uh, as I said before, or CenturyLink Cloud, which is a multi-tenant hosting environment. Um, that is a, that's been a huge IT accelerator for us as we've started to advance and start to figure out how do we manage virtualization inside the core of our you know, points of presence on the network. And as our network starts to expand, we're, you know, as most folks know, we're in the, you know, sort of the closing stages and the announced acquisition of level three. Um, as that transaction completes and the whole network gets even stronger, now we have more software assets to be able to drive even further into the core of that, that network. So it starts from the network, and everything we do from either a cloud neutral or a multi-cloud perspective is really around helping customers at the workload layer um, you know, to really thicken that, uh, that network value proposition. Yeah. Uh, I'm actually most yeah. also excited about the whole notion of computing on the edge. Yeah. And once you have a network of this scale and the ability to then distribute compute either on the edge, consult in the back, or even leverage third party public clouds seamlessly with a high, high bandwidth, you know, low jitter network, I think that's the foundational you know, infrastructure that's needed. And, and these guys have really done a good job of kind of bringing that to bear. So, yeah. pretty excited about that opportunity. I wonder if I, you can give us a little color on service providers. You know, when I go to most service providers, you know, 
most of them, you know, networking, you know, key strength. Obviously we know CenturyLink, you know, telco, <laughs> all, all that kind of background. You know, management layer, most service awesome. providers built their own. Uh, so there's a lot of pieces now when I see the Cloud Foundation suite and, and they're embracing it. How did you work through some of those, you know, hey no, we've got our way of doing things we know better as opposed to embracing yeah, no, the I, VMware, where's that give and I take? I think what's happening one is, one, you know, depending you know, on the sophistication of the service provider, the larger ones have the ability to kind of create a bare metal service, kind of drive higher automation, have the infrastructure spend to drive that. As you go a little bit of the down market, they're really looking for quote unquote a cloud in a box. You and I spoke about it last year, right? They want an EC2 type experience for the end customers without the cost and complexity of building one. So my opportunity as a service provider business is how do I give them that platform? that multi-tenant platform that can carve up resources. But in the future, elastically leverage a VMware Cloud on AWS, right? As an endpoint that they can start to use for geo distribution, DR, or simply new capacity. So we're going to see a world where they're going to start mixing and matching what they build, what they buy, right? And how they drive that. And the management solution around that, around a high performance network is going to be the future that I see together. Right? Yep. So one of the buzzwords over the past few years in industry has been the invisible infrastructure. <laughs> this concept that infrastructure should be something that people use and don't see. Right. How does CenturyLink help support, not necessarily making an invisible inf infrastructure, but this concept that is, this is something we use and don't see, right. from the network to the, this software layer that we're now talking about, where's the, where's the differentiating value that CenturyLink brings mm -hmm. versus you know, me rolling my own? Yeah, I think what, uh, where we've been making most of our investments and, and where we've been driving and focusing on success for our customers has been up at that managed services and application layer. And uh, you know, the, our, the way we view the infrastructure layer of the stack, and if we think of, when we think of stacks, we think of the network at the base level of the foundation, data center infrastructure at the next tier up, and then workloads and applications. It's not a groundbreaking uh, <laughs> tiered model, but it's how we kind of think and organize a lot of what's in our business. And when it comes to the infrastructure layer, you know, as I said before, we're in a highly interoperable posture with a lot of the other partner clouds because our network can link us there pretty seamlessly and because we still know how to orchestrate enough at the infrastructure layer. But the investment has really been inside the core of the network as we start driving that virtualization capabilities into the core. And then up at the workload layer, uh, what we really try to work around is, is creating, as, as in all computer science problems, you know, an abstraction layer where, you know, but the, the trick about an abstraction layer in our uh, part of the world and in, in our part of the industry is not creating one that creates a new layer of lock-in. Right, that allows each of the individual underpinning infrastructure venues to do their thing and do what they're good at. Um, you know, so we, we, we build that abstraction layer with the idea of a best execution venue mindset that lets each of those individual underpinning infrastructure offerings, whether it's uh, you know, the, the VCF architecture hosted up on AWS or whether it's you know, one of the other you know, particular software platforms because of geography or performance or service capabilities that they're good at, the trick of, of creating an abstraction layer is not locking anybody in or, or reducing those platforms to lowest common denominator. So with our cloud application manager offering, being able to manage our private cloud uh, based on VCF, as well as manage other environments down the road. That's really where we try to make that infrastructure invisible is to sort of create a lightweight abstraction layer that they can think more at the workload la layer than at the individual nuts and bolts layer. Yeah. So the great thing about it, creating an abstraction layer when you own the underlying infrastructure, it makes it a lot easier to support. So I want to make sure that I understand this concept from the ground up. You talked mm -hmm. about the network as being the glue or the foundation that ties all this together, especially yeah. with the level three acquisition. Yeah. From an IOT perspective, if I need those far-flung services, right. I have the physical network capability to get it there. Mm -hmm. If I need to put vSAN at the edge, we just had guests on talking about Absolutely. vSAN and at the edge, yep. and get that data into a CenturyLink data center uh, using VCF, to get it there and, and consistently have that same level of extraction, and then I can build cloud native applications on Azure, Google Compute, or et cetera, Hopefully because PKS I can go back on with, VMware or, as well, yeah, right? or yeah. AWS, yeah, yeah. And, and, I, I, and it's a consistent experience across Absolutely. that whole abstra abstraction layer. Right, right, and so you know, going back to that idea of that, you know, what we call the hybrid IT stack of network infrastructure and workloads, what we're trying to build is a platform that spans those layers, that doesn't try to own or be one or right. differentiate at one of those layers, is build a connective tissue that spans them. So a workload running on the right infrastructure venue connected to the right networks. 
we're investing in orchestration there that crosses all of that. And you know, it's really you know some of the great conversations we've been having this week with VMware about what they're thinking and some of the we think you know PKS is interesting because container container based deployment models are going to be what makes the most sense as you get further into the core of the network and out towards the edge. Uh, we think um, Pulse is interesting. Right, as we start to do more things in our smart cities and smart venue type of initiatives um, that we're doing at the, at the Internet of Things solution space as well. Yeah. Uh, Ajay, last thing I want to get to is, when you look at your partners, how do you see them, you know, both there's that similarity that they're, they're going to have, but how do they differentiate, and also, how will they participate in the VMware on AWS piece that we've been talking about? Yeah, so about? I think I'll, do, I'll break it in two parts, right? As I talk to a customer, the consistent feedback I get is, we've made, re, you know, resource consumption ubiquitous, right? And we're hoping to standardize that with VMware Cloud Foundation and other approaches. What's hard is the experience skill set and knowledge of how to use this technology. So increasingly we're constrained with the folks who know how to take this complexity, put an organized plan together, and drive the set of value around applications. So I believe the, you know, the cloud provider program and the partnership is really about moving up from trying to build infrastructure to build solutions and offer value to our partners. And the differentiation is really moving up stack in terms of that managed services value. The second part is, they themselves now have a choice. If I'm a regional player, I have a customer who has, a, everyone's a multinational nowadays, right? You always have some customer who happens to have reached beyond the boundaries. How do I now go into a new market? I can leverage VMware Cloud on AWS as a, another data center. And so the management technology we're trying to provide is we will probably manage your endpoint customer endpoint or even VMware Cloud, and you mix and match where it makes business sense. Mm -hmm. And then abstract that complexity, right? As we talked about, the cloud is a new hardware. How do we take that infrastructure and really make it easy? And the issues around security, management, are going to be different. Traditional forms of kind of the perimeter security we talked about. So application usage, value added services, being able to leverage resources, build or buy, is really the basis of our strategy. Yep. Yeah, and so we're excited to, you know, as, as we know that that platform you know, that program starts to expand a little bit more in 2018, and we've had some you know, early discussions with the VMware team around what that starts to look like, but at a most foundational level, because what we're already launching and what we launched here this week at VMware is just uh, you know, what we call our dedicated cloud compute product, which is now based on the VMware Cloud Foundation reference architecture. It's going to look the exact same as the VMware Cloud Foundation architecture that runs in AWS, and our approach towards managing both is to let their own individual uh, you know, control panels do what they do best, but then manage over the top of it with our cloud application manager service. Well, Dave and Ajay, thank you so much for sharing us all the updates. Look forward to watching the continued maturation and uh, development of what's happening yeah. in, in the cloud environment. Great chat, thank you. Thank you. For Keith Townsend and I will be back with lots more coverage here of VMworld 2017. You're watching theCUBE.